So starting in verse 48 might seem like a uh, awkward spot to just jump in. Um, it comes out of the section where, you know, they had said that Abraham was their father. Then they said that God was their father. And Jesus uh, kind of pointed at the way that they were rejecting himself and said that actually shows that actually Satan is your father, right? And so needless to say, um, that doesn't get from them any sort of inquisitiveness, please explain this, we really want to understand this. No, it just arouses them and, and the anger, the, the hatred, the bitterness towards Jesus comes out really strongly starting right here in verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Okay. So uh, this is quite, quite, a, quite a happening at the Feast of Tabernacles this year around, huh? This actually started all back in the beginning of chapter 7. And we've gone through most of this part of it now, and we have reached the, the great climactic point where this ends. I mean, we have seen, as we've gone through these recent weeks, especially the master evangelist that Jesus is, right? I mean, this is great evangelism. It's... It's pointed, it's bold, it's, it's true love. Um, there, there, are, there are compassionate invitations all throughout this that we have seen. Even, even for the abuse, frankly, that he's taking, he is constantly with his words reaching out to those in the crowd who might be of a humbler spirit to, 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 to consider what he's saying and recognize the grace that is available through the word and through through what it is eventually that he's going to do, right? He's continuing to do all that. And for all of that, you, as it goes on and he goes through all that, you get to the point now where they're just done. And they actually feel themselves to be justified in their religion in that they want to pick up stones and stone him to death because they fully recognize what he was claiming to be when he said before Abraham was, I am, right? But let's just break this down now. I mean, there's been a lot of back and forth up to this point that has been based in religion, but now and in understanding of truth and trying to trick Jesus or trap him or, or, or kind of get him stuck in his words where he couldn't explain himself. And of course, you know, Jesus, the, again, the master evangelist, always having the right thing to say. Then you get to verse 48 and what happens in verse 48. So Jesus is again responding to their disbelief 
at the pointed things that he's been saying to them, and they ask him a question that would basically not have anything to do with anything now spiritual or theological. This is simply an ad hominem attack. This is a insult, right? And it has two facets to it, right? Then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And here's, a, here's an opportunity, first of all, to remind ourselves of who the Samaritans were. I know we've gone over this before. Certainly when we were in chapter 4 and Jesus took, talked to the woman at the well, she was a woman of Samaria. And Jesus was passing through Samaria at the time and talked to her. And even the fact that she was a Samaritan woman even came up in their discussion, right? So who were the Samaritans? Way back in the ancient times before this, when the Assyrian Empire had conquered the northern tribes of Israel, and you can read this in the, in the Old Testament, uh, the way that the Assyrians historically are known to have conquered, um, there was a great severity and cruelty to it. They would basically uh, clean out uh, the land of their conquered peoples with uh, of most of their inhabitants and 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 forcefully uh, put people from other lands where they had captured people into those lands and 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 some uh, people that had been moved into the northern area of Israel began to intermarry with the Israelite and Jewish women and uh, and this went on for centuries and. Uh, they are called the Samaritans because they were living in that part of the northern kingdom of Israel that eventually, uh, after it had split off in the days of Solomon, uh, eventually had built their capital city in, in what became known as Samaria, right? And so, and so Samaria was the capital city of that region, and the people, after the Assyrian uh, uh, conquering, uh, became known as the Samaritans, and they were looked down at by the Jews. Th so, so you are right to conclude, if you're thinking this, that there is a great deal of bigotry in this, uh, in this insult. You're, you're, you're a Samaritan. That's just a way of, of wanting to put them down. It was a way, it was a way perhaps, that a Jewish person could insult another Jewish person because the Samaritans were viewed, of course, as not real Jews. So the way one Jew might insult another Jew would be to call them a Samaritan, right? Now, that was the first part of their insult. What was the second part of their insult? And you have a demon, right? So in other words, this, this stuff that you are preaching, saying that our father is the devil, right? that was viewed by them as something demonic. Again, there was an opportunity here for them of a nobler spirit to ask, what is it, why are you being so severe about this? What are you saying? But there's no humility, there's no conviction. I liken this to even later on, you know, in Acts chapter seven, when, when Stephen is making his defense before the Sanhedrin, it actually says that they gnashed their teeth at him, you know, and they ended up stoning him. This is what's kind of happening here because it ends up with them picking up stones. Now, so that's the insult. You're a Samaritan and you have a demon. Now, I love Jesus' response. How many times have I said that as we've gone through chapter 8 that I love Jesus' response? You can't not love Jesus of Nazareth when you see this particular response right here. Partly because of what he says, but also because of what he does not say. He says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. So after he says, I do not have a demon, he goes back into simply trying to explain what it is that's going on. So the insult was, you're, so, you're a Samaritan and you have a demon. His response is, I don't have a demon. What's missing from that? He did, you notice he did not say, I'm not a Samaritan, right? Why did Jesus not say, I am not a Samaritan? Well, he wasn't a Samaritan. But to say, I'm not a Samaritan, 
would have dignified their insult. Do you understand? And so Jesus was not going to go along with the insult, you know, because someone listening could say, ah, so someone very clever, uh, someone who is, you know, uh, looking to just trap Jesus in his words could say, ah, see, you think poorly of the Samaritans too. And that's something that could stick with him, right? But Jesus, listen, listen, 2,000 years before there was any such thing as canceling people, here was Jesus avoiding being canceled. I mean, that's how, that's how a 21st century mind has to look at this. I mean, Jesus just dodges something that would end somebody's career today, right? You know, I mean, to, for Jesus to respond to that, to say, I'm not a Samaritan, would, would be to infer that, oh, okay, Jesus thinks poorly of Samaritans just like they do, right? So Jesus just ignores that completely, right? And of course, that would be consistent with the fact that it was a Samaritan woman who was basically before this just about, just about the only person that we have seen him clearly say, I'm the Messiah. I who speak to you am he from chapter four, right? That was what Jesus said to a Samaritan. It was to that Samaritan woman that Jesus said, you know, the hour is coming and now is where you're not going to worship on this mountain. You're not going to worship in Jerusalem. The father is seeking those to worship him in spirit and in truth, right? So, you're not going to get Jesus buying into that kind of nonsense. So Jesus just ignored that part of it. But then the second part of it, he does respond to that. You know, you have a demon. Well, Jesus responds to that with the simple statement of fact. Again, he doesn't take it as a personal insult. You know, he doesn't just get up from where he is and storm out the door or, or of the temple and not come back or anything like that. He simply responds and tells him the truth. I don't have a demon. And then what does he do? This is, this is fantastic evangelism. If you have any desire to evangelize, and you should, here's the great example of evangelism. He doesn't start an argument about Samaritans. He doesn't start an argument about demons. He goes right back into what he was saying to them, right? Because he has said all these things before. I don't have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. That's what he had just been saying before this. Basically, what Jesus was saying is, if, if God were your father, you'd love me, right? And that's the whole point. I mean, the whole, the, the, the point of God sending his son to us and then opening up that way of salvation. As Jesus will say when we get to chapter 14, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through me, right? Jesus is the door of the sheepfold. I mean, Jesus is the, the one by whom we come in, Right? And so, uh, and he hasn't spoken those words yet. Those are coming up pretty soon. But, but uh, he goes right back to saying what matters. It's a great example of evangelism. He does not let himself get sucked into some kind of trite side argument that means nothing, right? So, I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, look at this, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. What an amazing statement for two reasons. Number one, that's an amazing statement simply because of the content of it. Here is Jesus again making this statement that if someone will come to him, through him, there is an escape from death. Physical death? No, we all physically die. Even Jesus physically died. Jesus is teaching again spiritually, right? They're not grasping anything in the spirit that Jesus is saying because as he's already explained to them, they can't because they're rejecting him, right? But he says, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. We deserve eternal death in hell, separated from God because of our sin. Jesus, who was going to go out after this and die, about six months after this, and die on the cross, was going to receive in his death the penalty for our sins. And then he was going to rise from the dead on the third day. And the person who puts their faith in him, the person who repents, turns to God, trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, that person, though physically their body will still die, they, es they escape that eternal death. They escape the, the right and certain and just judgment separated from God forever in hell. That's the eternal death that Jesus is talking about when he says, you'll never see death, right? 
So, 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 on like I said, on two levels. Number one, this is an amazing statement just because of the content of it, but it's also an amazing statement because what is it? It's an invitation. In the middle, listen, Jesus follows being insulted in, in their view. Jesus follows this ad hominem attack. You're a Samaritan and you have a demon. Jesus follows that by saying what? If anyone keeps my word, he'll never see death. That's grace. That's mercy. That's compassion right there. That, that's love. That's love, right? I mean, and this is the same Jesus who taught us what? Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you, right? Here's Jesus doing very, very good to people who are very much persecuting him, right? Yeah. Um, I was going to turn, for time's sake, I won't turn there, but back in John chapter 3, Again, isn't the, again, we see the Gospel of John always being like this great explainer of itself. It really is within the remarkable collection of literature that the New Testament and the whole Bible is. You have the Gospel of John, which is this just remarkable piece of literature all by itself, um, which, as I've pointed out a number of times already, is, is why to this day the Gospel of John is... is is very frequently published by itself and used in evangelism to give out. We give out Gospels of John when we evangelize all the time because the Gospel of John just seems to somehow capture like essentially everything you need to know, you know, all in this one little book. And it's amazing. You go back to John chapter 3 and that's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus at first was also a guy who didn't really grasp what Jesus was saying, right? When Jesus says, except a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says what? He says, um, he says, how, how can I, can I crawl back inside my mother's womb and be born? And of course, Nicodemus didn't literally think that, 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 a, that a man could do that, but that was a way of saying, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? So, so, but what it revealed was that Nicodemus was thinking about something natural, right? And Jesus said, no, I'm saying that you need you have, to, you have to be born of water and of the spirit, right? So, but but Nicodemus was not there the way these people were in front of Jesus. These people were hostile, unbelieving towards Jesus. Nicodemus went out of his way at night and approached Jesus and called him rabbi, right? And and acknowledged, "We know you're a teacher come from God because nobody could do these things unless God was with him," right? That's how Nicodemus started the conversation. And so that's what the signs and the miracles that Jesus did were supposed to do. See these things he's doing? This man is from God. We need to know what he has to say, right? Not like the people in John chapter 6 who saw what Jesus did, followed him across the water, and were basically like, we need more food from you. Right? And Jesus had to rebuke them and say, you only followed me because of the fish and the loaves. Don't labor for the food which perishes. Labor for that which endures unto eternal life. Right? But Nicodemus had come on the right terms. And so Jesus did what? When Nicodemus said, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Jesus explained it. He explained it. The wind blows where it wishes. You know, you hear the sound of it. You can't tell where it's coming from, where it's going. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. And he goes on and he explains these things, right? So it's just, it's marvelous. And here you have Jesus now, though. Here, Jesus is in the face of people who have just laid a very serious personal insult on him. And he responds by saying what? Anyone who keeps my word will never see death. Wow. There you go. That, what we, grace and love and mercy epitomized in beautiful Jesus. How did they respond to that? Did they respond to that, being amazed at his grace and his love? Nope. Now we know you have a demon. Now we've got you. You know why? Because Abraham's dead and the prophets. Abraham and the prophets, they're all dead. You said, see, they think they've got him now. See, that's what this all is. It's like, it's like a legal debate to them, you know? It's like, it's like we're, we're trying to trap them somewhere. Aha! You're not going to taste death if you keep my word. Abraham's dead. The prophets are dead. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never see, never taste death. And then this, are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? 
and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be, right? You're, you're putting yourself in a position greater than Abraham and greater than the prophets. Who are you making yourself out to be? I love Jesus' answer in verse 50. I said it again. I love Jesus' answer. Of course I love Jesus' answer, right? Uh, if, if I honor myself, he starts like that because he's, he's responding to their question, what do you, who do you make yourself out to be, right? They're accusing him of like making, him out, making himself out to be some great figure because they're, you know, greater than Abraham and greater than the prophets. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus basically says, I don't make myself out to be anything. I'm, there is one who makes me out to be what I am, right? So Jesus, even there, he points to his father, right? If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my father who honors me of whom you say that he's your God, right? Yet, you have not known him, but I know him. All right, now ready? Here's another thing that good evangelism does. In great boldness, watch what Jesus says here. And if I say, I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Wow. Now, may I say to you, that's not done in this, clearly that is not done in the spirit of personal insult. Jesus is simply as they might say in the modern world, spitting facts at that point. Because that's the truth. Jesus is telling the truth, and he's already shown them to be liars, and he's already shown them to be children of the devil. And Jesus basically says, I'm not honoring myself. God honors me, but I'm not going to back away from the fact that I know him. If I back away from the fact that I know him, then I'm making myself a liar when I just told you that you are all liars and children of the devil who was the father of all liars. Right? So he's just giving them straight info. And, that, and, and listen, we need to be compassionate but bold and accurate like that when we explain the gospel of Christ to people as well. You see, the diff you see the difference between what Jesus says here and what they said in verse 48? There's, there's absolutely no truth element to verse 48. Samaritan and demon-possessed. That's just, that's, just that's, that's just a petty personal insult. There's nothing to do with anything we're talking about. What Jesus says here, I'll be a liar like you. That, that's actually 100% relevant to what he had just been talking about in the previous section of this discourse, right? So this is all, it's all part of the discussion. It's on the table, so to speak. So, uh, but I do know him and I keep his word, all right? Now, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Wow, how, you might even ask yourself reading this, because Jesus doesn't really explain that, right? How is it possible that Abraham saw Jesus' day? Now, this, this takes a little of what they could have done. There's two things they could have done. They could have consulted scripture, which we're going to do in a moment here. They also could have asked, like, like Nicodemus with the humbler spirit. How, how is this possible? I crawl back inside my mother's womb and be born? That's, that's something very different than, you must be demon-possessed to say something like that. I need to be born again. You're, you're, there's, there's none of that. There was none of that with Nicodemus. Here, if, if, if in the humble, seeking spirit, they said to Jesus, Please explain. Please explain. Do you think Jesus would have? There's plenty of evidence we've already seen just in the few chapters of the Gospel of John that we've read that Jesus is more than willing to be patient with people and explain what he was talking about. Even when he taught the great parable of the sower, the disciples asked him, what do these things mean? And Jesus took the time and literally explained the parable of the sower to them told them, if you don't understand this one, you're not going to understand any of them. Then he broke it down for them. And, you know, there's truth for us there. If you read Scripture and study Scripture and you find yourself having a hard time with it, here's the great blessing of Scripture. It's a little bit of a cliche, but when the, the, the great thing about the Bible that makes it different from 
from, from every other literature in the world is that you can have a living, active, personal relationship with the author and ask him for help in understanding it. And if you approach him with humility and respect and faith and patience, right, he will help you to understand Jesus said, in fact, when he went back, when he's going back to heaven, I'm going to send you the helper and he will show you all things. He's the, he's the, you have any need for any man to teach you. You can go right to God and say, Lord, help me. I want to understand. I want to honor you. You know, you can be like Solomon. Give me wisdom so I know how to rule these people. God is more than capable. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know this. I hope you do anyway. I hope you read and study scripture. I hope you listen to preaching and teaching and Bible studies and everything else. And I also hope that there are times where you just turn to God and say, Lord, help me understand this because I want my faith in you to be strong. I want to persevere in my faith and I want to honor you and even have the chance to share with these things with others. Right? But they didn't do that. But they didn't do that. Well, before I go on to what they did, let's us take the time to understand what does it mean that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad? Abraham is their father, right? Um, Jesus acknowledged that Abraham was their father, not in the spiritual sense, but in the physical sense. Jesus did acknowledge that they were the, the descendants of Abraham. Jesus himself, according to the flesh, was a descendant of Abraham too, wasn't he? Um, in fact, Jesus was the the, the object of the covenant that God made with Abraham, talking about in his seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. In fact, we're going to turn back and look at some of that right now. Um, you might want to keep a little bookmark there in the Gospel of John. And I want you to follow me in your Bibles now through a few passages in Genesis, just to take a look at Abraham and his relationship with God. Ready? Turn. Let's start in Genesis chapter 12. I'm not going to give a ton of explanation here. I just want you to see these things. What does it mean that Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day? Ready? I'm going to do this fast. So get ready to flip some pages. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord, and you see the L-O-R-D capital letters, you know that's Yahweh. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Was Abraham glad to hear that? I would say that he was. Who wouldn't be? But we know that he believed it because look what verse 4 says. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, right? So that obedience was evidence of the fact that he believed what the Lord had said. Now go to chapter 15 and verse 1. Chapter 15 and verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord uh, came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I love that statement. No time to break it down right now, but God himself is our great prize, right? Um, but Abram said, Lord God, and you see there that the, the English G-O-D is in capital letters. That's Yahweh. And the reason it's published like that is the preceding word Lord is the Hebrew word Adonai. And they didn't want to publish it in English, Lord, Lord, you know. So there, Yahweh is rendered God in all capital letters. It's the all capital letters uh, that, that, that tip us off to the tetragrammaton. Um, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H in English. So, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? It's pretty amazing that in, in the beginning of this vision, um, it doesn't quote God as having identifying himself, right? It just tells us that the Lord came to Abram in a vision and he didn't say, I am Yahweh or I am God yet, right? But Abram says, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, who's a servant of his. Then Abram said, look, 
you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And look at this. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Right? Verse 7. Then he said to him, I am Yahweh, who brought you out of Ur of the land of Chaldeans, to give you this land to inherit it. So there you go. God makes his covenant promise to Abram when he's still known as Abram. And Abram gets this tremendous promise from the Lord and he believes the Lord. There is a gladness, there is a joy in the promise that God has made to Abraham. Now look at chapter 17. Chapter 17 and verse 1. Lots of time goes by. Lots of time goes by and no baby's been born yet. He's promised an heir of his own body. Nothing yet. When Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. He's 99 years old now. And when God appears to him and says to him, walk before me, do you see how he responds to God? He responds in reverence and worship. Very different than the way the Jews are responding to Jesus in his day, right? This is starting to get at now what Jesus is talking about when he says, Abram rejoiced to see my day, right? You know, and, and you see here the oneness now of the Father and the Son, you know, their unity, right? And that becomes very powerful at the end of, of chapter 8 in the Gospel of John, as you'll see in a moment when we go back there. Uh, just continuing with this here in, in Genesis 17. My covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, uh, the father of a multitude. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. He gives them the sign of circumcision, and once again, God just affirms his promise, and Abraham's a very old, and now his name is Abraham, and he's a very old man now, and he's still responding in faith and adoration and worship and respect and, and believing and joy before God, right? Then we get to chapter 18. Now, this becomes very important. Then the Lord, Yahweh, appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. I mean, clearly Abraham recognizes who this is. That's coming to him, right? Again, what, why are we reading this? Jesus said that Abraham rejoiced to see his day and he saw it. Here was God appearing, here in human form, God appearing to Abraham, right? And how does Abraham respond? Sure didn't respond like the way the Jews in Jerusalem did when Jesus was there, right? That, that's the idea. Abraham is rejoicing at, the, at, at God's visit. I will bring a morsel of bread and at, you may refresh your hearts, etc. Um, they said, do as you have said, goes in, tells Sarah to make ready uh, the, the meal and everything, kills the fatted calf and, and, uh, and it basically goes on to promise that uh, the time had come that pregnancy was going to happen and 
and you were going to have the child. The child was going to born and be born. And of course, you have the intervening story after this of the Sodom and Gomorrah and all that. But eventually, Isaac is born, and there's great rejoicing. Then after Isaac is born, I won't turn there now for time's sake because I'm reading a lot of this, but when you get to chapter 22, after Isaac is born and after he grows up for some years, what happens? God says, take him to Mount Moriah, to a place where I'm going to show you and offer him as a sacrifice to me. And what does Abraham do? He believes God. He believes God. And he takes him and he binds him and he's ready to sacrifice him. And right at the last moment, God stops him from the sacrifice of Isaac and says, now I know that you really believe me and that you will obey me. That's a very different reaction to God than the reaction of the Jews in Jerusalem in John chapter 8. And I think this is what Jesus is talking about when he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You know, when God visited Abraham, Abraham believed and rejoiced and was blessed. When God visited the Jews in Jesus' day, they hated him and they wanted him to be put to death. And that's why Jesus would say, you say Abraham's your father, but you're, you don't do what Abraham did. You want to kill me. Abraham didn't want to do that, right? All right, so now I want to, I want to read to you. Go back to John chapter 8. As you're turning there, let me just read to you. I mean, you can turn with me if you want. I'm going to read a verse from, it is a Bible study, so maybe you want to do this. I'm going to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 recounts for us a little bit of uh, Abraham. Hebrews 11, 8. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. That was in Genesis chapter 12. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him. Of So it includes all of his descendants as being of similar faith. Uh, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, a reference to the agedness of Abraham, were born as many as the stars of the sky and in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Now look at verse 13. These all died in faith, look, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's the difference between Abraham in his day and the Jews in Jesus' day, right? Abraham didn't live to see, I mean, he lived to see the birth of Isaac, but he didn't live to see the fulfillment of everything that it was going to lead to. But he had the promises and he believed the promises. And because he believed the promises, I love this, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They recognized that because God had visited them, living in this world didn't even matter to them anymore. Compare that with how the Jews responded when Jesus visited them. They wanted him dead. And that's why it is such a, sh a, a stark contrast to when they, or, or when they say that Abraham is their father, Jesus, being eternal God, knowing all of this, is like, you, you say Abraham was your father. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And you see, again, Jesus is speaking of spiritual things. And what is their reaction? Carnal as you can get. You're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. They're just looking at it strictly from... Of, of, listen, of course in the flesh Abraham wasn't physically there. That's not what Jesus is talking about, right? 
I mean, Jesus is speaking from the perspective of one who has eternally existed with his father and was part of all of these things that had happened prior to, to, to his time here on the earth. But all they can see is a man who is not even 50 years old yet. And have you seen Abraham? And I love Jesus' answer. I said it there. It's like the third or fourth time I said it tonight. Most assuredly, he starts this with a most assuredly, I say to you, what? Before Abraham was, right? So he speaks in past tense concerning Abraham. Before Abraham was, and then he speaks in the eternal present tense concerning himself, I am. And when he says, I am, that's on the one hand, a statement all by itself that speaks to his eternality. But what else is it? He's taking the name of God from the burning bush episode where I, I just printed it out just to read it to you. Moses, when he's at the burning bush and God tells him to go and, and, and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, Moses asks, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay, Moses, when they ask you, you tell them this, I am has sent me to you. Do you think the Jews in front of Jesus that day were familiar with this? Yeah, I think probably so, right? And I can prove it by what the reaction is in verse 59, right? So when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, this is one of the most direct, maybe the most direct claim that came out of his mouth concerning his own divinity. There are the other I am statements of Jesus throughout the Gospel of John. Um, we've already seen in chapter 6 that he said, he, I am the bread of life, right? And the thing that kicked off this whole discourse was, I am the light of the world, <laughs> But still coming in our study of the Gospel of John is, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the true vine. So those are the, the, the famous I am statements of Jesus. But this one, there's I am, period. There is nothing after it. This is, this is, this is a direct claim simply to be the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And finally, they understand something that he said. Finally, they get it. There's no more questions. Now they understand. Because remember, what started this? They asked him, who do you make yourself out to be? Right? Who are you? Who are you? you person who keeps your word, they'll never die. Who do you make yourself out to be? Before Abraham was, I am. Oh, you're God, are you? That's basically it. And what's their reaction? They pick up stones to throw at him. And the rest of it, Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. He's actually not done at the temple yet. There's more. There's more that comes in chapter 9. But he's done at this. He's done with this part of it. And of course, he's not on the timetable of himself. He's not on the timetable of any men. He's not going to be stoned to death by them. He is going to die, but he's not going to die at that Feast of Tabernacles. He's going to die six months later at the Passover because that's what he was sent to be, was God's lamb, the Passover lamb, right? So uh, his hour had not yet come, as we've also seen him previously say. But they, listen, sometimes you, you talk to like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or or whatever, and they, they, they don't believe that Jesus is God. Or you just talk to atheists or agnostics or people that just mock Christianity and mock religion, mock the idea that Jesus is God in the flesh. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Jesus certainly claimed to be God, and the people that didn't like him certainly understood that he did. So you cannot ever make the case that the Bible does not present Jesus as God in the flesh. 
How does the Gospel of John start? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we're told that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So God was made flesh. That's how the Gospel of John starts. And here's Jesus with his own mouth in the clearest of possible ways, claiming to be God, and the proof that they got it was they wanted to stone him. Right? Because to them, to their carnal, unbelieving, wicked, reprobate minds, he was committing blasphemy. But in fact, his works, the witness of his father, the witness of the miracles, the witness of the scriptures, the witness of John the Baptist, as we've seen, everything pointed to the fact that Jesus was absolutely telling the truth when he said that. Right? Wow. Wow. Can I take the last couple of moments that we have here together? Because what we've done over the last weeks is we've pieced this so we get everything. But now, this should be refreshing. I want you to go back to verse 12, and I'm just going to read from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Because now, hopefully, you've followed these studies and you have this in your head now. And I want to just read this to you, and then this is where we'll end our study tonight. I want to just read this to you from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. And now you've got some of this in your head. So now watch how all this flows. Because all of these studies that we've taken weeks to do, this all happened at once. Right? So, so let's get that continuity again as we close. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have also known my Father. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to him, 
to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. They said to him then, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who's dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Remarkable, is it not? <laughs> Wow. Well, all right. Praise the Lord. We've gone on long here tonight, and I appreciate your patience. It's been a great study. We go forward into chapter 9 starting next week. I'm just going to leave it there. Let's close with prayer.